Would you harder to hate? You know, I'm very satisfied with the response to the hated characters list. All of you guys, even the ones that disagreed with the points I made, were really polite and respectful. Seriously, give yourselves a pat on the back for that one. Of course, no list is perfect, and there were mistakes I made. While I certainly believe Iris more than earned her place on the list, I see a valid interpretation that she didn't do what I thought she did. Granted, it still looks like it to me, but I can see the other side. I'm not apologizing for what I said about Abby, though. Anyways, one topic that some of you brought up was the possibility of making the list that's the opposite of the hated ones. A list of characters we like, but we're supposed to hate. Gotta be honest, this was unsurprisingly difficult. It's a lot easier to accidentally make a character hateable than it is to accidentally make a character likable. Because of that, I had to broaden the scope a bit. So here are the many rules. First off, charisma is not a factor. After all, there are plenty of entertaining characters that are still other expletives. Basically, if you're intended to be entertained by the character's force of personality and relishing being a villain, I'm not counting them. Now, the character must be intended as unsympathetic, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be a villain, so jerk characters and anti-heroes are very much allowed. As for the ways that a character can be seen as unintentionally sympathetic, there are a few. Maybe they had a backstory that was more relatable than intended. Maybe they actually raised a good point about something important which the game never acknowledged or followed up on or was even hypocritical about. Another factor could be begrudging respect. I may find them appalling on a moral level, but they're written in a way that makes it hard to feel any anger towards them. Or sometimes they're a bad guy, but the other side is significantly worse. Or in some really annoying cases, maybe their paranoid or even bigoted actions turn out to be completely justified. To summarize, I'm going to be ranking these characters based on how big the disconnect is between what the game is telling us to feel and how we actually feel. With that out of the way, let's dive in. Darth Vader, arguably one of cinema's most iconic and compelling villains. Once a Jedi Knight with unlimited potential and a grand destiny, he was slowly tempted towards the dark side and betrayed everyone he held dear to become the Lord of the Sith. Why do I mention him, you may ask? Because Arthas Menethil did his story ten times better, and it includes absolutely none of this. No! Getting back on topic, Arthas was the crown prince of Lordaeron, a kingdom overrun with a terrible plague. Motivated by his childhood dream of being a hero, Artie was determined to rid his land of the plague, no matter the cost. With a really big emphasis on no matter the cost. With the epidemic not slowing down, a teensy bit of desperation started to creep into Arthas' repertoire. I mean, if you consider mass genocide of an infected city, making deals with mercenaries only to turn on them, and then stealing a cursed sword to be teensy. So, my bad. Once he took hold of the Frostmourne, his fate was sealed. He became a vessel for the Lich King and used his newfound darkness to further the plague and raise his own army of the undead, a chilling reflection of his previous noble mission. If we can look past how awesome he looks as the Lich King, we really should hate Artie for his slow fall into darkness, cause let's face it, he progressively did more and more despicable things. But in the grand scheme of it all, I'm a victim of circumstance! I'm not even joking there, he really is a victim of circumstance. He can't help but feel sorry for him because along the way, he kept finding himself in one bad state of affairs after the other that forced him down the dark path. His main motivation was always for the benefit of his kingdom and putting an end to the plague. That culling I mentioned, the only reason he even thought of such a slaughter was he wanted to stop the plague from spreading more outside the city. Does that make him justified? It, maybe in intentions, but not in planning or execution, especially since it didn't even work. If you couldn't tell from earlier, I'd say that Arthas' story is pretty much Anakin Skywalker done right, falling to the dark side under unfortunate circumstances rather than, let's be honest, being easily duped. The funny thing is that unlike Vader, Arthas didn't really speak much once he became the Lich King, and yet even looking at him shows he carries a certain weight. That combined with his lore is reason enough to justify his reputation as one of the most popular World of Warcraft villains of all time. Still, sympathetic backstory or not, he still took things to the extreme without looking for any other variables. So he's down at the bottom of the list where he belongs.
When I first posted the tweet looking for suggestions for this list, I had a lot of suggestions from the Danganronpa franchise. However, I think the ones that really need our pity today are the adult resistance from Ultra Despair Girls. The resistance is a small group of survivors aiming to restore peace by stopping the Warriors of Hope, their terrorizing Monokuma servants, and ending their murderous game once and for all. Unfortunately, they cross the line in the end when they tell Kamaru to destroy the controller, knowing full well it will kill hundreds of brainwashed kids, so that costs them a lot of brownie points. Not to mention that the leader Haiji turns out to be kind of an a-hole, so he doesn't qualify for the entry. The rest of the resistance, though? There's only one thing I want you fellas to do. What's, What's that? that? Talk me out of it. They're allegedly cowards. They keep out of sight as much as possible and avoid being hunted and killed as much as they can. And they're totally justified. The Monokuma units are literal killing machines, and these guys aren't some all-powerful army rising against the system. They're a small group of normies put into a horrible situation and just wanting to come out of it alive. Does that make what they tried to do right? No, not in the least. And yet, you can kind of see why they're doing this. Because they're afraid. Fear does things to people. I believe this quote from Xenoblade says it best. Fear robs us of reason. Out of fear, we commit terrible atrocities and call them acts of self-preservation. A lot of Danganronpa culprits are usually portrayed more ambiguously. About 80% of them walk the line between right and wrong, and it kind of depends on how sympathetic or reasonable they are, which shows whether we can call them an a-hole or not. Plus, there's the fact that being trapped in a horrific death game can really wreck a person's morals. That rule doesn't really apply to Ultra Despair Girls since it's a completely different situation compared to the killing game, and it's mostly about survival instincts more than anything else. So really, the resistance is neither right nor wrong in what they do because they were never given the choice. And really, if you looked at one of these killer teddy bears and said with a straight face that you're not scared of them, then maybe I should be scared of you. I talked about vanilla in the previous list. You're not gonna like this next one. Final Fantasy XIII is a game with a lot of issues, between its restrictive gameplay, linear map design, and overall complicated story. And then you get into the sequels, where it introduces time travel, and it just goes downhill from there. Now, 13's characters are usually sitting in this mixed bag of awkwardness. You got terrible characters like Vanille and Non-13-2 Hope, and you got decent characters like Sash and Fang. Then, there's Snow and Lightning. Lightning is the main protagonist, and despite the hate towards her, she's pretty neutral for the most part. Snow is a bit more awkward. You don't know if you're supposed to hate him or like him, honestly. In the first moments of 13, he leads a resistance against the Purge, but accidentally causes the death of Hope's mother. Instead of looking for her son like she wanted or even seeming depressed, he still carries his happy-go-lucky attitude and drives to save his fiancée, Sarah. Hope absolutely hates him for this, his singular drive for Sarah, and his failure to fully comprehend the situation at times. Many players were on board with that and disliked him too, something I feel the developers were aiming for. He sees himself as some great hero, but doesn't hold himself accountable for his actions. He has the charisma, but lacks the responsibility, and that's a pretty decent setup for a character arc. Unlike most of the other characters, his singular drive to save others and Sarah is true. While he has a big mouth and it can be annoying at times, it sometimes feels like he's the only one willing to do something about his problems. Yeah, he usually goes about it the wrong way, but at least he tries. At least he doesn't mope around, whine and complain and brood or go on a murder spree or actively make the situation worse by hiding the truth, Vanille! When Snow finds out that Hope was the son he was looking for, he risked his life to save him multiple times and even begged for forgiveness from Hope's father. Throughout everything, he personally never lost Hope. Even after Sarah turned to Crystal, even after fighting Partandalus and learning the truth about their focus, he still tried to defy the fate he was given. Unlike Lucina, though, Snow couldn't do it. While he was able to shake off the events of 13 and 13-2, Sarah's death in 13-2 finally caused his confident mask to shatter, and he entered a deep depression as he hid in a deep castle waiting for the end of the world. He did become a character we weren't supposed to like, but we also felt sorry for him. Until, again, like with Vanille, Lightning Returns killed their development dead. <laughs> While Snow is considered to be the third worst character after Vanille and Hope, I really want to 
to show that he's an underestimated character in the lore of 13. And let's be honest, not a lot of the characters in 13 are great, so if we adjust our standards accordingly, I think you can see why he lands on the list. Now, if he didn't have a one-hit kill attack in the battle against him in 13-2, then I'd like him a lot more. The Devil, Satan, the first fallen angel, Aphrodite. Wait, what was that last one? Yeah, fun fact, the devil only started being referred to as Lucifer in the King James version of the Bible. Later translations only refer to him as such out of tradition. Lucifer is actually used to describe the Morning Star, aka Venus, aka the Roman name for Aphrodite. Lucifer can also be translated as Lightbringer. The only time the devil and the word Lucifer were used together was to decry Satan's old position as the right hand of God. This leads us nicely into the Shin Megami Tensei 4 version of the devil named Lucifer. This version of him is on this list specifically because of how he's represented. In Shin Megami Tensei 2 and Nocturne, he's often depicted as a reasonable young or old man, basically a well-intentioned extremist. You understand why people would follow him despite his flaws. In Shin Megami Tensei 4, it's a bit more complicated. Lucifer is hostile, violent, arrogant, merciless, and supremacist, but so are the ones he's fighting against. How can the other side claim to be good and clean when they share similar attitudes, just not methods? Yes, the only beings who matter to Lucifer are his fellow angels, which is why he tried to usurp God. Deep down, he wants to be understood. He wants his kin to see things how he sees things, that God made them suffer needlessly. Yet those angels still say that Lucifer is filth and must be destroyed alongside all of humanity. Being disowned simply for having a different perspective? I think many of us can identify with that. The conflict is made all the greater by the fact that the protagonist is torn between two of his friends. Jonathan gives up his entire being down to his very soul to summon Merkaba, the chariot of God, and the being able to match and defeat Lucifer. Walter, on the other hand, chooses to fuse with a demon to revive Lucifer. No matter what you do, you lose both your friends to beings almost beyond human comprehension. So then it becomes a matter of whose sacrifice you choose to honor, or which eldritch horror you feel isn't as bad as the other. Despite the game doing everything in its power to paint both sides as problematic, it still can't help but feel sorry for Lucifer. He's a being literally made of desire, the desires of the sons of man. And what greater desire has man than a desire for freedom? And as Mark Twain said, but who prays for Satan? Who in 18 centuries has had the common humanity to pray for the one sinner that needed it most? Our one fellow and brother who most needed a friend yet had not a single one. The one sinner among us all who had the highest and clearest right to every Christian's daily and nightly prayers. For the plain and unassailable reason that his was the first and greatest need, he being among sinners, the supremest. Then you remember it's Satan. All right, just a heads up, we're gonna be talking about Fire Emblem Three Houses. So just mentioning this character's name is going to raise some eyebrows. If you don't want spoilers. Edelgard is complex. Those who played past the time skip know what I'm talking about. Edelgard is one of the house leads that you can side with and is the leader of the Black Eagles, a group from the Adrestian Empire where Edelgard is the crown princess. She is the only princess or heir for that matter. That's because she and her siblings were all experimented on by a shadowy race to grant them the gift of two crests of power, and Edelgard was the only success and only survivor. Yeah, we got dark quick. The events of those experiments colored her opinion of crests and the Church of Saros who granted favor based on crests and the birth lineage of them. She wanted to create a world that would respect more the merit and skill of people rather than blood and lineage tear down a theocratic oligarchy and make a meritocracy. To do this, she became the Flame Emperor, the game's initial primary antagonist and the instigator in the war that was hinted at post time skip. She became Emperor of the Adrestian Empire and used her influence to attempt to combine Fodlin into a unified state, destroying the church and, eventually, those who slither in the dark to obtain her new age. The problem with that is she will kill hundreds to achieve her goal. She has no mercy for those who go against her and will even side with the people who experimented on her just for the power to go against the church. Despite this, we understand her. 
A merit-based society compared to one that favors nobility and birthright is the more favorable choice, especially to those not born into nobility, which is most people. But the way she tries to do it is insane. Even when you choose her route, it's hard to find her actions morally just. We agree with her goals, just the means are the problem. Of course, you could always just choose Golden Deer since Claude's ideals are very similar, he just won't kill hundreds to achieve it. While Edelgard is a revolutionary, her background and ideals make you feel for her and understand what she went through and why she thinks power leads to the true ideal world. It sucks that no matter what route you choose, unless it's hers, she dies. Because she would rather die than live in a world that she failed. At the very least, she can have peace with her mission. Honestly, I just blame the Agarthans for everything. Just goes to show that the Golden Deer was the best route. Lies and slander! Josh, it's time for your entry. Honey, what am I doing on the list? I mean the Until Dawn one. Oh. Until Dawn opens up with an incident involving the Washington sisters, Beth and Hannah, after falling for a prank done by their skeevy friends. Needless to say, the reaction went far, far south. A year later, the older Washington brother Josh announced a reunion party in the Mountain Cottage once again, despite the awkward atmosphere and unwelcome memories. Shenanigans ensue. Throughout the game, the characters all come across horrific events like being stalked, assaulted, and even threatened to participate in horrific Saw-like games. So much so that some of them get badly injured from all that hassle. The twist? It was Josh himself who's behind these games as all part of his special little revenge prank with the side bonus of getting his friends famous on YouTube. We know the violence and gore he set up was fake and all, but... Mr. Yellow Dollar Sign giveth no fucks. Yeah, Josh was really gratuitous with his pranks. Because of that, everyone suspected his involvement with the friends that got actively hurt or even killed throughout the night. He could have reasoned around it like a normal person, but at this point, he's way too mentally adrift to not sound like a total creep with every word he spouts out. I got a problem, Mike. I don't remember killing Tess. Jeez, Christ. I mean, like, I feel like I, I would remember killing her, you know? She's a saw. Yet despite all of that, it's hard to really fault it all on him. I mean, Ari was mad at him once she realized he was the psycho, but she still feels bad for him. Josh is actually rather harmless, despite his machinations. He never wanted to kill anybody. While he arguably held ill will towards his friends, he never went so far as to take unwarranted measures for revenge. I mean, put yourself in his shoes. How would you feel if good friends of yours made an utterly humiliating and heartless prank that led to the deaths of both your siblings? You would not be okay. Having no involvement with what's actually going on is one thing, but even factoring in his overzealous antics, you can kind of see the jigsaws that build up to the puzzle of his psyche. All his life, he had mental problems that he couldn't overcome. Every doctor who took him on couldn't help him. How is a boy whose mental state was precarious to begin with supposed to deal with the grief of losing his sisters to a cruel prank? Especially since the only ones he thought he could rely on took part in said prank. The closest he got to a consultant was Dr. Hill, and let's just say there are more assuring things than a man who gave his heart to the desk. Sure makes me glad we don't see another rise of prank channels. Good riddance. You ever that one guy in a group who's always stuck up their butt about what they think is sophisticated that's just exhausting trying to be mutual with them? That's Solus in a nutshell. The elven hedge mage boasts pretty remarkable confidence regarding his intelligence. Unfortunately, he can never tolerate anything less. Living up to the indulgence of his elf pride and his holier-than-thou rights to look down on other races, he has no qualms calling you out for making questionable decisions that endanger his kin. That might strike you as a loyal elf, but he himself would do the same thing if given the privilege. And he just shrugs it off as something that had to happen. You could try to take the time to understand him, but I say you're going to need a heart of steel to put up with someone so begrudging and pessimistic. Four times out of five, anything you say to this guy will aggravate him to some degree, and I have no idea what the issue is. It's like he just decides to hate you for fun. Passive answer, disapproves. Act like a smarty, disapproves. Punch in the face, disapproves. But at this rate, why not? 
Honestly, this guy came so close to making it on the hated characters we're supposed to like list, since it strikes me that we're only supposed to pity him for his background. Until the Trespasser DLC rolls in. As it turns out, this guy is pure evil, completely morally bankrupt, and is more than willing to kill everyone to restore the legacy of his lost kin. Given how much of a prick he's been, I was so ready to write him off as an antagonist, but darn it! The game beat me to it! If it was I, my machinations lay undetected for years, for I'm a master of deception. Making a character loathsome to build them up as a villain is something that can easily be handled poorly, as it would make everyone look stupid for not seeing it coming earlier. But the way Solus was written, especially given the decisions he made prior that contradict his moral code, actually made it less predictable. He went from a guy you'd think would be redeemed to someone you absolutely must terminate, and I weirdly respect that? It's not like I feel sorry for him, I don't! He's a genocidal freak whose xenophobia can make devils blush! But, ah! From a storytelling standpoint, I can't find it in myself to hate him anymore! The setup for it all was so genius, it's making me crazy! I was completely blindsided and utterly bamboozled, and I love it! The only thing I hate about this is that it's made me question my conviction to stop buying EA games. Whenever writing this good pops in, I keep finding myself debating if it's worth it. How I love you, and yet I hate you. It's funny. We've seen Mark Hamill play characters on both sides of the spectrum, good and evil. But what about that little gray area in the middle? For now, that space shall be occupied by the one who put the square in Square Enix, Master Ericus. Yes, they really went with that anagram. Anyways, Ericus was Terra and Aqua's master and former chums with Xehanort. He has a bit of a chip on his shoulder with the darkness, going so far as to try and kill anyone with even a smidgen of darkness in them, including Ven or Terra, his own student. Okay, yeah, clearly he's being way too biased and paranoid, right? You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? For the record, I don't condone what he tried to do with Ven and Terra, like, at all. He was an idiot for trying to kill them. But on the other hand, in Birth by Sleep, everyone in that game was hit with the idiot stick. It was a contrived, perfect storm of bad decisions and stupidity, so let's benchmark that accordingly. If we ignore the fact that Xehanort was manipulating everything from behind the scenes, you could still argue that Ericus is being irrational, because, as I'll preach a few times, light and darkness kind of go hand in hand, so destroying either would ruin the delicate balance. Is there a balance, though? I know it sounds like I'm getting off track, but bear with me. I'd like to bring up a little moment in the same game between Aqua and Cinderella's fairy godmother. Aqua wants to go Leroy Jenkins on Lady Tremaine and the Stepsisters, and literally no one would blame her, but fairy godmother stops her because one can't exist without the other. Except the Tremaines end up getting consumed by the darkness anyway, and suffering karmic death meaning that Aqua had every right to be paranoid about the darkness. That same scenario applies to Ericus's dilemma. He was paranoid about darkness leading to everything getting screwed over. If he really was wrong, if both the light and darkness are perfectly balanced, then why is everything the darkness's fault? This is also why I can't accept Master Xehanort's motive reveal at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3. He was the one who tempered the darkness in Ventus's heart. He was the one who sowed discord between the friend group and Ericus. He was the one who unleashed the Heartless and Hollow Bastion. He claims to hate the darkness, yet none of the tragic events in Kingdom Hearts would have even happened enough for him starting them in the first place! I smell... A CONSPIRACY! In the end, Ericus ends up being proven right by Xehanort in his little darkness binge. While Ericus took things a little too far, you can't really fault him when the numbers are in his corner. Seriously, if darkness is working overtime to cause mass suffering and light is the only way to beat it back, why should we pull the 180? Bowser is one of the most iconic villains in gaming, and also one of the most pathetic. He gets beaten soundly in just about every appearance to the point where it's hard not to feel sorry for him. With that said, there's a few reasons he's not on the list. For one, he's shown to be a legitimately loving father towards Junior and does respect his minions from time to time. For two, he's been portrayed with more sympathetic traits in the RPGs to the point where he's even joined you as an ally on a few occasions. But to find a truly unintentionally sympathetic Mario character, we did have to look into the RPGs. Enter Tubba Blubba from Paper Mario. Tubba Blubba is formally introduced to us in a scene where he casually devours a helpless boo in broad daylight. Right off the bat, we have a clear reason to hate him. 
Plus, he's a terrifying, invincible enemy that chases you down in his castle. That should make it all the more satisfying when you cut off the source of his invincibility and beat him, right? Well, after you do, he explains that the whole reason he went on his rampage after Bowser gave him power was that the booze repeatedly took advantage of him for being timid. Yeah, what a villain. With that one detail, the entire paradigm is shifted and now feels less like you just liberated a town from an evildoer and more like you just learned about your school bully's abusive home life. Of course I want to change it but it's the only defense mechanism I have against deeper, more terrifying problems buried inside of me. Yes, an eye for an eye makes everyone blind and all that, but in Blubba's case, we were shown that the boos were okay the whole time. Meanwhile, the boos picked on him for no other reason than they could. It really doesn't help that Bo's reaction to the whole thing is just to casually laugh it off. It's okay, Blubba. We're laughing at you, not with you. So, are we just going to ignore the fact that you're arguably the cause of all of this, or- Shut up, Nip! This is what you do! Wheatley from Portal 2. It really wasn't his fault the programming of Aperture is designed to make cores go insane. Captain Walker, Spec Ops The Line. Yeah, the guy commits several atrocities, but he's clearly insane, and the developers intended you to feel the disconnect. Roger Rettins, Ace Attorney, Spirit of Justice. A D-bag who represents everything wrong with the media, but he did have his hopes crushed by a hardly defensible magician troop. Jaina Proudmore. Yeah, she's kind of a bigoted bench in Miss of Pandaria, but... One really cool trend we saw back in the 2010s was formerly underground franchises breaking into the mainstream. Persona, Yakuza, Monster Hunter, Fire Emblem, and Xenoblade all had dedicated followings before, but are now bringing in more fans than ever. Among these is Nier Automata, which blew players away with its frenetic action, deep characters, and philosophical storytelling. Its success led to some fans checking out the original Nier and the game's predecessor, Drakengard. And... Let's just say that the early installment weirdness is strong with this one. The biggest issue with Drakengard can be summed up in four words. Creative ideas, weird execution. Nowhere is this more evident than with the game's main protagonist, Kaim. Kaim is a character that we are supposed to straight up despise. You're supposed to see him as a mass murdering psychopath. He's supposed to be the embodiment of the player that kills all the clearly sapient enemies to power up and show what that person would actually be like. In other words, he was the original Chara. Heck, they even got the same haircut. The game really wants you to hate him and constantly has the other characters as well as the very narration itself call him out. Full of bloodlust as always. But there's one teensy weensy but ever so crucial little tiny detail. Nearly every one of Kaim's murders are completely justified. The game seems to forget the fact that Kaim is a soldier fighting a war where the other side wants to destroy seals to release an eldritch abomination upon the world. Also, the enemy soldiers are almost always portrayed as nothing more than simple video game enemies for you to kill. As mangled as the phrases become, Kaim is just doing his job. Is killing hundreds of people horrifying? Well, yeah, but that's unfortunately the sad reality of war. He even gets a surprisingly humanizing moment in one of the branches where he rightfully rejects fury, fury, this lady's romantic advances towards him. And if that sounds callous, keep in mind, they're siblings! With that out of the way, there's a pretty big elephant in the room we have to address. At this point, the people who actually played this game may be asking, Well, Josh, what about that stage where Kaim slaughtered all those child soldiers? How can you possibly defend that? Fair enough, and I'll tell you. Okay, this part is going to be a little long-winded, so just bear with me. You see, there's this term in gaming called ludonarrative dissonance. This refers to when a disconnect occurs between how the gameplay makes you feel versus how the story makes you feel. Or is supposed to make you feel. An example of this can be seen in Last of Us 2. In Abby's side of the story, we see her enjoying time with her dog. This is supposed to make you feel bad for killing the dogs when you play it as Ellie. The problem, though, is that the dogs are some of the most annoying enemies to fight against. So there's a good chance a player may feel the aforementioned ludonarrative dissonance and not sympathize. If you want further examples, listen to Yahtzee's poem in the video, Wine Out of Ten. 
Going back to Dragonguard, the stage I'm referring to is when you're forced to kill a bunch of child soldiers. It's very clear that this game wants to be the equivalent of the white phosphorus scene in Spec Ops The Line. The moment that makes you put down the controller and say, Wait a minute, Patrick. I'm the maniac. <laughs> On paper, it seems fine. The child soldiers let out death cries and your companion character is absolutely appalled by it. If Drakengard wasn't a game, there probably wouldn't be a problem with this scene. The problem is that there's a conflict between what the stage is saying versus what you're playing. The child soldiers don't behave all that differently from your standard enemy. They run up to you and hit you until either you die or you kill them. If they wanted to make the player feel bad about it, you could have made the child soldiers run away and behave more like, well, children. With all that said, you may be asking, well, couldn't Kaim have just attempted a peaceful solution like just talking to the child soldiers or using non-lethal methods or just running away? Well, there are problems with all those solutions. One, Kaim couldn't talk to the child soldiers because he can't speak. His pact rendered him physically mute. Two, given that this game takes place in the year 1099, non-lethal takedown methods weren't really something that was taught. Proper wound care and field medics weren't a thing either. Therefore, even if Kaim attempted to, say, stab a non-vital area, it would likely lead to death via blood loss or wound infection. Three, Kaim was absolutely surrounded by the child soldiers and, at least in terms of gameplay, is far from a fast runner. I've gone on for long enough at this point, so I'll just cut to the chase. Kaim, while absolutely a total jerk, is far from the mass murdering sociopath we were supposed to see him as. The one would-be atrocity he does commit is done in such a clumsy manner that it's difficult to see it as the game intended, at least for me. The one silver lining to all this is that Yoko Taro genuinely learned from his missteps. Nier and Automata did a far better job at linking story and gameplay together, while Drakengard 3 give us a far superior villain protagonist. I'm the Fiery Joker, and I'll see you in the comments. Again. Cut. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member, and you'll get rewards like this. Our name shoutouts come from Ryan Anderson. Thanks for watching.